The opening chapter of the Adam and Eve story, The History of Cataclysms by John Thomas presents a vivid and horrifying scenario of a massive, unprecedented global catastrophe. The onset is marked by an all-consuming earthquake, shaking California and triggering a colossal tsunami that engulfs the entirety of North America in its wake. Cities like Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago, New York, and Boston are eradicated completely, with only a few fortunate survivors who find shelter on high mountain peaks. The catastrophe is not restricted to North America, Central and South America are equally tormented by the cataclysm of wind, earthquakes, and floods. The Andes prove insufficient barriers to the onslaught, leaving countries like Ecuador, Peru, and western Brazil devastated. Europe, Africa, and the Middle East aren't spared either. The Atlantic Ocean surges towards Europe, overwhelming the Alps, Pyrenees, Urals, and Scandinavian mountains. Western Africa, including the Sahara Desert, also falls victim to the catastrophe. In Asia, Siberia, Manchuria, China, and Burma face a similar fate, subjected to earth-shattering winds, earthquakes, and freezing temperatures. The cataclysm continues for six days, repositioning Antarctica and Greenland into the torrid zone, thereby dissolving their ice caps and raising global sea levels. The seventh day marks the end of this devastating rampage, ushering in a new ice age. This catastrophic event serves as a harsh reset, obliterating the relics of the previous civilization, reducing the human population drastically, and pushing the survivors into a new stone age. The chapter concludes with the mention of legendary figures in places like Noah, Adam and Eve, Atlantis, Mu, Olympus, Osiris, Taroa, Zeus, Vishnu, and Jesus, signifying the start of a new era post-cataclysm. Chapter 2 explores various theories on cataclysmic earth changes. It underscores the agreement among scholars from different fields that the earth's surface has experienced abrupt and profound changes. The history of these theories, contributions from early researchers like J. André Deluc and Georges Cuvier, and the attempts of scientists such as Velikovsky, Hapgood, and Hugh Brown to elucidate these cataclysms are all explored. The chapter introduces Professor Frank C. Hibben's hypothesis of a comprehensive extinction event, prompting the author to seek explanations for these cataclysmic occurrences. Following extensive research using data from diverse scientific disciplines, the author confirms previous cataclysms' occurrence. However, the cause, process, and timing of such events remain unexplained, laying the groundwork for further investigations into the Earth's catastrophic history. Delving into Earth's history, the chapter discusses ancient civilizations, mythological figures, and the concept of recurring cataclysms, suggesting that mythological entities like Vishnu, Osiris, and Noah were real survivors of cataclysms. It also posits that the lost continents in the Atlantic and Pacific were more than mere legends. The structure of the Earth, specifically two molten layers, is then discussed. The chapter highlights the role of these layers, despite being white-hot, in behaving nearly solid due to the Earth's interior's magnetic and electrical structure. The potential for a cataclysm if there's a disruption within these layers is examined, though the precise trigger remains a mystery. The author also surveys geologic, historic, and cultural evidence supporting the theory of cataclysms and shifts of the Earth's poles. Notable examples include the age of various landmarks, extinction events, abnormal solar behavior legends, and global language similarities. The chapter wraps up with a table listing areas that were once at the North Pole and their duration there, emphasizing the abruptness of these shifts. This fresh perspective suggests that figures like Noah, Adam, Eve, Osiris, Taroa, Zeus, and Vishnu were survivors of such cataclysmic shifts. Chapter 3 Enigma Pursuit Unraveling commences with the narrator contemplating a childhood question about the Genesis creation story. He proposes this story may hold a basis in a real cataclysmic event around 11,500 years ago, rather than being a purely religious narrative or a dismissed fabrication. The narrator delves into the potential roots of Genesis, considering the theory that the story may have first been written in a prehistoric language, translated and passed down through generations. He cites scholars like Don Antonio Batris Joroqui and James Churchward, knowledgeable in ancient languages, for further insight. 
the chapter explores theories on Genesis's origins, speculating it may have descended from pre-Egyptian cultures, passed down verbally, and potentially subjected to inaccuracies during the rewriting process after some Old Testament writings were destroyed. Interpretation of Genesis over time is discussed, including the influence of language and societal views. For instance, the literal interpretation of the story could be due to Moses and Aaron's inability to read ancient glyphs, and prevailing views of women's inferiority may have influenced Eve's portrayal as the catalyst for humanity's downfall. The narrator ends this segment by decoding key Genesis symbols such as the tree, serpent, and cherubims, through Naga glyph's understanding, proposing Genesis as a metaphor for a cataclysm that occurred 11,500 years ago. The next segment offers a reinterpretation of Adam and Eve's story, using an analysis of a Naga civilization glyph. This glyph shows three figures, a top figure resembling a sleeping or deceased person, a middle male figure, and a lower female figure. The author suggests that this glyph depicts Eve's creation from Adam's rib, with a surprising twist, the top figure, supposed to represent Adam, is portrayed as a female. Curved lines, traditionally seen as ribs, are posited as symbols of lineage in Naga culture. This suggests the top figure is a deceased female, and her offspring with the middle figure, Adam, is the lower figure, Eve. The author further aligns this interpretation with the biblical legend of Lilith, considered to be Adam's first wife, suggesting Eve is both Adam's and Lilith's child. The chapter concludes with the understanding that Adam and Eve left their homeland, symbolized by a tree encircled by a serpent, due to a prophesied cataclysm. Eve foresaw the destruction of their homeland due to inherited ancestral intelligence. A catastrophic earthquake eventually submerged the continent, providing an alternative Genesis interpretation where Adam is a widower, and Eve is both Adam's and Lilith's daughter. The fourth chapter, titled The Event, focuses on the author's interpretation of a significant geological and astronomical event that occurred approximately 11,500 years ago. The author paints a picture of the Earth as it may have appeared at that time. The Hudson Bay was at the North Pole, and there was a large continent in the Atlantic that extended from England to the Bahamas. Western Australia was covered in ice, while Eastern Australia was teeming with life. There was also a continent in the Pacific, now only marked by islands such as Hawaii, Easter Island, and the Galapagos. Civilization thrived in the province of Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, Greece, and the Amazon Basin, which was then an inland sea. The author also mentions Tiwanaku, a prehistoric city in Bolivia, which was then a seaport at sea level. About 11,500 years ago, the Earth experienced a major shift in its shell, causing the North Pole to move southward and the Sudan Basin in Africa to shift to the North Pole. This event had catastrophic impacts, leading to massive earthquakes, huge mountain formations, and violent inundations from oceans and winds that wiped out almost all life on Earth. The shift lasted only a quarter to half a day, but the aftermath continued for six days, with the oceans and winds gradually settling down on the seventh day. The Laurentian Ice Age ended with this shift, and the Earth entered the Old Stone Age. Despite the cataclysmic destruction, remnants of ancient civilizations and languages, like Mayan, managed to survive in various parts of the world. The author concludes the chapter by linking these events to various legends, including stories of survivors and the biblical narrative of Adam and Eve. The next chapter offers a fresh interpretation of Genesis 1, 2, and 3, translated directly from an alleged language known as Naga into English. The narrative aligns the creation story of the Bible with events dating back to 4.32 billion years and a cataclysmic event 11,500 years ago. The chapter recounts the formation of the universe, the sun, and the earth, followed by a cataclysmic event on earth 11,500 years ago that led to massive storms and floods, plunging the planet into darkness. Post-catastrophe, light gradually returned, and the distinction between day and night was restored. Dry land emerged as the waters receded, allowing vegetation to regrow, and celestial bodies like the sun, moon, and stars were again visible. Marine and aerial creatures survived the disaster according to divine providence. By the fifth day post-disaster, life began to proliferate in the seas and in the air. On the sixth day, land animals, 
including humans, were confirmed to have survived, with the responsibility to repopulate the earth and dominate all creatures. Plants were reinstated as the primary food source for all beings. The seventh day marked complete recovery from the cataclysm, symbolizing rest and survival, signifying the end of the catastrophe. It then delves into the post-cataclysm regeneration of the earth, human survival, and the inception of civilizations on flood-surviving continents. Post-cataclysm, all flora was re-established, and a man arose and lived by divine will in a new land called Eden. From Eden, more civilizations sprouted on diverse lands. Eden, the seat of wisdom and knowledge, was eventually lost to the floods, leaving only its four progeny lands. These lands are associated with the Pison River, the Gan River, near Ethiopia, the Hittical River, east of Assyria, and the Euphrates River. The descriptions, however, may be inaccurate or incomplete. Adam, a descendant of original mankind, lived in Eden. After his mate's death post-childbirth, Adam raised their daughter. The narrative transitions to a calmer ocean era. The woman in the story, not originating from the progeny lands, was destined to learn the fate of the peoples from the offspring lands versus the motherland. She and Adam, her father, aware of the impending inundation, knew they would survive despite the dangers. After the flood, Adam made his daughter, Eve, his wife. They migrated to a colder climate and fashioned coats from skins. Adam, as per divine will, took with him the wisdom of good and evil, leaving Eden to cultivate the soil elsewhere. Eden faced another cataclysm, an earthquake coupled with an earth fire, causing it to submerge beneath the oceans. Chapter 6, Cataclysms Revisited, Investigates Past Cataclysms Five major events are detailed, Noah's flood marking the New Stone Age, Adam and Eve's flood initiating the Old Stone Age about 10,500 years ago, a third event around 18,500 years ago with scant data, a fourth roughly 29,000 years ago, and the oldest cataclysm traced back to 43,800 years ago by mathematician Jess Hale. Each cataclysm is likened to a giant hand leaving lasting imprints on the earth, providing valuable data for understanding history. Noah's flood notably reshaped the global geography, instigating features like Niagara Falls and drastically raising ocean levels. The chapter then delves into evidence for these cataclysms, discussing phenomena like the frozen mammoths and sloshing of fast-moving muck water, evident in the Monument Valley's stratified layers. The chapter carries on exploring geological evidence supportive of cataclysms reshaping Earth's geography. The evidence in sediment layers shows rapid deposition due to cataclysms. A remarkable example in Mexican hat presents unusual mountainsides with sedimentary layers bent towards a river, pointing to a cataclysmic event causing massive fissure and surface deformation. The author challenges existing geological reports, contending that no evidence of lava flows exists in Monument Valley but rather scorched sedimentary rock from cataclysms. Further evidence, such as non-granitic granite blocks in the Jura Mountains, indicates high-speed water movement during cataclysms. Evidence of civilizations vanishing due to cataclysms is also discussed, citing abundant mammalian teeth at the boundaries between sedimentary layers as an indicator of widespread destruction of animal life. Finally, the chapter revisits Tiwanaku, a deserted Incan city. Despite vandalism by Pizarro's group, valuable information was extracted from the remaining structures and carvings by various researchers. John Thomas discusses the links between astronomy, geological phenomena, and ancient civilizations. It explores the Bode-Tidious Law, the origins of Earth's moon and previous moons, and potential cataclysmic events causing major shifts in our solar system. It references ancient stone constructions and geological evidence of cataclysms. The author also explores the narratives of cataclysms captured in various texts and archaeological evidence, such as the Shanidar Cave in Iraq. It discusses correlations between Genesis and other ancient stories that might have recorded experiences from these cataclysms, such as Noah's Flood and Adam and Eve's story. Lastly, it presents the discovery of the city of Nineveh and the library of Asurbanipal, which held the Epic of Gilgamesh. Utnapishtim, a character granted eternal life, recounts his survival of a cataclysm, mirroring biblical and other ancient cataclysmic tales.
the addendum expands on cataclysms, history, and ancient civilizations with new evidence and discussions. It starts with Dr. Arthur Bless's observations on the sun's declining temperature, hinting at an impending cataclysm. The text further delves into the epic of Utnapishtim and archaeological findings supporting a historical global cataclysm. It explores possible connections between Greek and Polynesian languages and prehistoric Mayan words, possibly recounting a cataclysm ending the Laurentian Ice Age. The addendum also discusses Hannes Alvain's research on magnetohydrodynamic MHD, energy, proposing it as a potential cataclysmic force. It discusses the theory that Earth's shell could shift dramatically, potentially relocating regions like Greenland and Antarctica towards the equator, due to a drop in Earth's MHD energy when passing through magnetic null zones in the Milky Way. The text suggests increasing cataclysm frequencies as the universe nears its half-life, with another possible cataclysm in 7 to 200 years. The author calls for an intensive study to predict the next cataclysm and humanity's preparation for it. The conclusion features three different religious and philosophical traditions Hindu, Greek, and Hebrew each telling a tale of a cataclysmic event, reminding readers of the ancient and universal nature of such stories. In the Hindu tradition, it's described how Indra, the king of gods, rebuilds his palace with the help of the god of works and arts, Visvakarman. The tale also suggests the recurring nature of the world's creation and destruction. The narrative implies that such cycles have occurred infinitely, as represented by the continuous emergence and submersion of a Taurus's shell from an infinite ocean. The Greek text is from Plato's Timaeus, where an Egyptian priest suggests to Solon that the Greeks, and indeed humanity as a whole, suffer from a collective amnesia. The priest tells of great calamities like fire and floods that regularly wipe out civilizations, leaving only those uneducated in the sciences and arts. This causes humanity to continually restart from scratch, ignorant of its past. The Hebrew scripture from Psalm 46 provides a more metaphorical depiction of cataclysm, referring to the earth being moved and mountains carried into the sea, presenting a firm, calm response to such world-shattering events. The shared thread in these narratives is the recurrent nature of cataclysmic events and the impermanence of human civilizations, as well as the enduring spirit of humanity in the face of these disasters.